All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Matt, for the kind introduction. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's an honor for me. I'm really excited about the lectures that we have planned for you for the rest of the year, all going to be engaging um, theological education from different perspectives, um, but focused through the lens of the greatest commandment, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, and thank you, Pastor Ted. Thank you for coming to be here as well. It's a great honor and blessing for me. Okay, go back with me, if you will, to the fall of 2012. Joshua Jipp is a 31-year-old 31, 31 PhD from Emory, just in hand, and newly appointed hire at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Full of enthusiasm, his academic dean, the venerable Teet Tianu, has sent him to an ATS, that's Association for Theological Schools, an ATS gathering for newly appointed tenure-track hires. There's one scene that weekend that stands out with particular clarity in my mind. Dan Alshire, the highly respected executive director of ATS, begins his talk by saying something like this. He says, people frequently ask me, Dan, if anyone can answer this, it's you. What is theological education going to look like in 10 years? What will the state of theological education look like from in 10 years from now? And Dan's response is something like this, from what I remember. I have no clue. I've been involved in theological education for years, for some three plus decades. My role as executive director has afforded me numerous opportunities to see and to learn from all types of divinity schools, and I don't know. In fact, I have no idea. Elshire's parting words Encouragement, I think, where they're supposed to be encouraging, but also an exhortation to us were something like this. Buckle up. It's going to be a wild and an interesting ride. Now, I wonder if anyone here would challenge the truthfulness of Alshire's predictions. Financial difficulties resulting in seminaries closing or consolidating. A proliferation of different modalities for the delivery of educational content. Instability within many Protestant denominations, often leading to splits. The politicization of basically everything, leading at times to more culture wars and social invectives, social media invectives, and let alone the disruption that COVID-19 has wrought in so many different spheres of life. Those invested in theological education have not signed up for a simple life. Furthermore, there's increased confusion over the goal of theological education. Is it what I like to call the Netflix model, making good biblical theological information as widely disseminated as possible? I mean, who can be the first to deliver seminary level lectures and videos? Or is the goal of theological education a means to ministerial efficiency, what I call the career model? Is it to provide pastors and leaders with specialized knowledge and efficiencies so that their ministerial work will be more efficient and more successful? Is it the goal what I, of what I call the activist model, namely to form students into good citizens, maybe even activists who can agitate for peace, justice, and the well-being of society? Is it to produce citizens who know how to engage the ecological, racial, and economic challenges of our current age? Well, today, what I want to do is I want to ask the question that I think for a long time I've simply taken for granted, namely, what is the goal of theological education? When theological education is flourishing and it's working well, we might not feel the need to spend all that much reflection on this. But when theological education is unraveling, or appears as if it may be unraveling, and there's a proliferation of new approaches, creative strategies and initiatives, new modalities for teaching, so on and so forth, then the goal of theological education, the question, what is theological education for, strikes me as more urgent. Now, of course, I can't solve the challenges of appropriate modalities, the challenges of rising costs for theological education, the rise of secularism, or the huge percentage of nonverts, that is, those who have deconverted from their faith traditions. But I hope that by exploring how the Apostle Paul does theological education in his own context, I hope that this might provide us with at least some wisdom for what we value, for how we make decisions as we seek to be faithful to our calling as those entrusted with the gospel. I've titled the lecture today, Learning to Love, Loving to Learn, Going to Seminary with the Apostle Paul. Because I think all of us would agree that the pursuit of learning, 
Some type of knowing is at the heart of why we're all invested in theological education. Seminaries, divinity schools, those devoted to theological education in one way or another are unapologetically focused upon learning. But what type of learning, what type of knowledge is it that we're after? Is it knowledge as information? That's an encyclopedic access to all the necessary content we need? Is it knowledge as doctrine, a capacity to be able to speak intelligently and well as a Christian? Is it knowledge as technical and professional skill, maybe perhaps knowing how to plan a service, how to counsel a couple in marital difficulties, how to read biblical languages? Well, yes, but what is the goal of theological education? I want to argue that the goal of what we're doing, the goal of theological education, the purpose of our learning, is ultimately to cultivate a loving knowledge of the triune God. It's basically an extension of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.5, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's, to some extent, what I want to argue is that we should not be Christians who would roll our eyes at what is truly the central virtue in something that's identified with God and demanded among his people, the central virtue in the scriptures in the Christian tradition. Wendell Berry has stated this, He says how intimately related and how nearly synonymous are the terms know and love. How likely impossible it is to know authentically or well what one does not love and how certainly impossible it is to love what one does not know. So I'll argue for the deepest theological connection between learning and love by drawing upon the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul's letters fascinate me, not least for the way that his theology is attentive to the deepest concerns and challenges his churches are facing. That is, for the way in which he's constantly pressing to bring his knowledge and relationship with the crucified and risen Christ to bear upon the very practical and mundane issues that are facing the church. And what are Paul's little churches and communities, if not learning communities, Churches devoted to learning what the mind of Christ is and how to live it out. Paul, in fact, made personal visits to his churches. He sent co-workers to make visits. He penned letters, all for the sake of a certain type of theological education, so that his churches would learn and thereby grow in their knowledge of Christ. I mean, these letters are theologically engaged missives, seeking to shape and form his churches to live out the mind of Christ. But we need to be careful. We know knowledge apart from love can be used to exploit, control. Knowledge apart from love can be used to draw attention to ourselves, to exalt ourselves over others, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8. So we need to distinguish between two types of learning. The person who desires knowledge in order to obtain power, control, and status, and the person who desires learning so that he or she might share more deeply and intimately in the life of the subject matter. And given that for us, the subject matter of our education centers upon the triune God, the type of knowledge then that we're after is one that draws the closest possible relationship between learning and love. We desire knowledge of God so that we might more deeply love God. But knowledge without love is barren, and love without knowledge is simply mere sentiment. As one author notes, there is a knowledge which is called love or charity, because love itself is knowledge of him in whom it is directed. For in proportion as we love, to that extent we know. We can think of this analogously to a relationship between two close friends. The more I learn about my friend, the more I grow in love for that friend. And my increasing love for that friend will result then in my increasing knowledge of that friend. So Pauline theological education sees the deepest relationship between our love and our learning, our affections and our knowledge. So the argument, the thesis that I have to offer to you today is that our theological learning is worthy of our time, our attention, our effort, when it's oriented towards the love of God. Because we as humans are created to be learners and lovers. So I want to unpack this by looking at three ways. 
three ways that theological education can form us as learners toward the love of God. First, articulating a way of life. This is really my fundamental thesis here in terms of supporting what I've just said. Theological education orients our entire way of life toward the love of God. I think to some extent, maybe the main goal that Christian theology has consists in answering and asking and answering a question above all else. Namely, what is the goal of human existence? Why are we here? What are we supposed to actually do with the lives that we've been given? Or more theologically, what is the purpose for which God has created humanity? And the answer to this, I think, is something that's simple and yet revolutionary. Let me put it this way. For the Apostle Paul, the telos of human existence is sharing in the life and love of the triune God. Theological learning, then, is worthy in itself as the supreme good for which we were created. From before the creation of the world, Paul says in Ephesians 1, God's plan was to create a people with whom God might have loving communion. So for Paul, God is inherently relational and loving. God created humans in his own image because he wanted to share God's own life with them so that they would know him, so that they would love him, and that they would grow in moral conformity to God's character. In other words, stated a little differently, if there's two things, and I'm sure there's more, but if there's two things that Paul's crystal clear about in terms of who God is, it's this. First, God is a father who has a son that he loves. The father and their son, out of their life-generating love, want to share their life with humans. And they do. In one of the most Trinitarian texts in the New Testament, Romans 8, 14 through 17, Paul speaks of us as sharing in Christ's sonship through the Holy Spirit who causes us to cry out, Abba, Father. So God is interpersonal, familial, and the one who initiates loving communion with us. And second, the main attribute or characteristic that Paul uses to describe this God, of course, is that of love. Notice here how when Paul speaks of each event in the history of Jesus Christ's saving acts, he does so with the language of love. Right? All of God's plan of salvation is motivated out of the triune God's love for humanity. God elects humanity from before the foundation of the world so that we would be adopted into his family out of love. The Son of God is sent by the Father and becomes incarnate out of love. The cross is the place where God demonstrates his own love for us. God sends the Spirit, then, of the risen Christ into the hearts of believers. So, as we see in Romans 5.5, 5, so that we'll know and experience the love of God. And God resurrects, enthrones, exalts the Son of God to the right hand in heaven, so that we will never be separated from the love of God. So, given that sharing in the life and love of God is only possible through relation to the person of Christ, Paul speaks of knowing Christ and relationship to him to be the singular surpassing good and goal of human existence. To know Christ, to love Christ, to be in relationship to him is the goal of human existence for Paul. I like how J.I. Packer states this in Knowing God. Packer says this, what were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set in our lives? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? Knowledge of God. And I like how Packer then goes on to say this. He says, what we have said provides at once a foundation, shape, and goal for our lives, plus a principle of priorities and scale of values. In other words, to some extent, Paul, uh, Packer is sort of using the language of ancient philosophy here when he speaks of Paul's education, theological educational program, this is my language now, but basically is consistently setting forth humanity's supreme good. Now, in ancient philosophy, a supreme good is something that's complete. Everything you do or pursue is for the sake of it. It's self-sufficient. Nothing of ultimate value is left out. And it's a life map. It makes sense of the entirety of one's life. So Paul, of course, makes so many theological claims. So much theology in these 13 letters. But all of them are ultimately in service to the supreme good of sharing in the life and love of Christ. Now, I have to go through this too quickly, but let's look at one text. I'm not even going to read it. Philippians 3, where we see one place where Paul clearly describes how loving, 
participatory knowledge of Christ as humanity's supreme good. Now, in Philippians 3, you can read the text, or maybe you have it memorized. Notice how Paul uses a variety of economic terms to articulate what's supremely good. There were things that he once considered to be gains that are now losses. What Paul might have once built his identity upon, ethnicity, certain form of Torah observance, education, these things are now described, he says in verse 8, as human excrement in light of his knowledge of Christ. Paul's language we recognize here is remarkably intense and passionate, and this passion, I think, almost certainly derives from the fact that, unlike the Stoics positing or the Epicureans positing of the supreme good, for Paul, the supreme good is a living, knowable, relatable, personal agent. It's a living person. So Paul sets forth the person of Christ as the singular good to which everything else is then subordinated. And Paul states that his new way of understanding is a result of him coming to know, you see in verse 8, what is the surpassing value, namely knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. What is this item of surpassing value? Once again, it's knowledge. It's a loving knowledge of another person, Messiah Jesus. And Paul says he has in fact suffered the loss of all his former pursuits so that, in verse 8, he may gain Christ. The supreme good, though, notice of which Paul speaks, is not something that's a state one fully achieves in this life. It's rather a future-oriented quest with the goal of resurrection life laying before him. So Paul's motivation in verse 8, that he may gain Christ, in verse 9, that he may be found in him, is made explicit in verse 11 when he says that he is waiting for the resurrection from the dead. You see this in verses 12 through 14. Paul's teleological orientation is future-oriented. He's not yet been perfected. Two references to his forward-aiming pursuit in verse 12 and 14. Verse 13, he's straining ahead forth for that, that, that which lies in front of him. And in verse 14, there's the one thing that motivates his pursuit of this goal. So why is Paul's supreme good to know and love Christ? It's because the incarnate and crucified Christ has entered into resurrection life on our behalf. And because relation to, knowledge of Christ, is the way we are made to share in God's life, which is, as I've argued, the goal of human existence. Now, with more time, we could look to see how Paul uses a variety of metaphors and images to show us that Christ is our supreme good. And he does so in order to stimulate our love and desire for that future when our communion with God will be perfected. Right? In some places, he speaks of it as Christian theologians use language of it as the beatific vision, 1 Corinthians 13 or 2 Corinthians 3, where we'll see Christ face to face. Some places, he speaks of it as glorification, waiting for the day when we will share in the glory of God. In some places, he uses the language of being resurrected with Christ, where we will share in Christ's fullness of life. But all of these ways of speaking set forth Christ as the supreme good and are intended to draw us into a greater love and hope for sharing in the communion with God. And you might be asking the question, well, what does this have to do with theological education? I want to offer a couple of reflections. First, it was once the case that universities were devoted largely to exploring and offering compelling visions for the meaning of life, for the care of the soul. In other words, on what it might mean to live the good life and to flourish. Universities and intellectuals were not simply about the production and dissemination of data, information, and facts, but were places where you could have a free exchange of ideas about a good human way of life, how it could be articulated, how we could debate it, how we could live it out. But now, it's rare that universities would even think of exploring or offering a coherent vision of the good life or of human flourishing. Some recent proposals to the contrary lately, but by and large, this has not been the case as of late. Universities instead are primarily focused on instrumental and technical skills, right? Leaving it to you, to the student, to decide what larger goal, which is basically always wealth creation, their knowledge and technical skills are going to serve. And maybe seminaries aren't always as different as we would hope, insofar as they're thought of as primarily, at least, conferring professional credentials or offering technical skills. But seminaries are distinctly suited to be places that provide robust visions for humanity's supreme good, compelling articulations for the good life, and for exploring the implications that follow from the goal of human existence as something that's sharing in the life-giving love of God. 
As Christians, I think all of us, of course, believe that humans have been created for life. We've been endowed with a longing for divine transcendence. Right? And this ultimate purpose of life is union with the God, the triune God who is life. Right relation to him. There's visions of the good life being promulgated now in our society everywhere you look. If you notice this, TED Talks, professional conferences, monthly articles in the Atlantic and the New Yorker, some of them are giving us revivals of ancient philosophy, Stoicism and Epicureanism, even Aristotle. And you can groan, I understand, but why are people so enthralled with people like Jordan Peterson or Alex Jones and others who make their living as self-help gurus? Why does almost every issue of The Atlantic have an article having to do something with how to find happiness with bad relationships or how to be happy in the midst of adversity? Why does the wellness industry, culture, SoulCycle, CrossFit, and others, why does it have a $4.2 trillion market? Like them or not, they're offering a, a cohesive way of life, a seemingly rigorous philosophy of meaning-making meaning for people that are starved to know how to spend their one life, how to find meaning and purpose. Why are they here? So whether we like these particular ways of life, I think they tell us something we need to hear. Humans are creatures of desire who long for meaning, purpose, even transcendence. As Tara Isabella Burton chronicles, she says, Americans are on a quest for knowing, for belonging, and for meaning. They're on a pilgrimage, and none of us can get out of it, end of her quote. But what other way of life takes its starting point from an interpersonal God who's not only all-powerful, but is powerfully loving? So maybe theological education, too, can reframe, if it isn't already doing so, reframe theology as a real way of life, not just an education in techniques, skills, and information, those are all good, but as a theological education that gives guidance for humanity's deepest longings and loves. Anyone who cares about the human condition, about what it means to be human, about how to live well in the world cares about, I think, and will spend time reflecting upon how to give robust answers to the basic features of human existence. Jordan Peterson's doing well with giving us answers, like them or not. Philosophers reviving Stoic and Epicurean philosophy and making it accessible for people are doing it. CrossFit's doing it. The positive psychologists, Jonathan Haidt and Arthur Brooks are doing it. We could go on and on here. But if we believe we have the answers, and we believe that the God who is love has revealed truth to us, we should be doing this as well. So what would it look like for theological education to provide robust answers and spaces for students to articulate a truthful account of their own lives as shaped by their divinely given telos of sharing in the life-giving love of God? If we believe that Jesus offers us the true way of life, then we need to be providing spaces to explore how every aspect of our human existence, our identities, our work, our sexuality, our relationships, our emotions, how we suffer, how we face adversity, and even death, how those can be ordered toward what is truly good, namely sharing in the life and love of God. Okay, my first thesis is really the fundamental argument. Theological education takes as its starting point in unfolding all the implications of humanity's supreme good in every sphere of life. In the remainder of my talk, I want to look a little more briefly at two of the most important practices that follow from the first thesis, namely how we read scripture and do theology, and then also how we use our knowledge for the good of others. So if the goal of human existence is communion with the life-generating God who is love, then the constant reminder to all of us is that our teaching of theology, our study of doctrine, our study of the lives of the saints, all of it has as its ultimate goal not only the, well, not just the imparting of information. Yes, this is necessary. I'm obviously not against information. But it has as its primary goal the stimulating of our longing, our hope, our holy desire for the goal of our existence, namely loving knowledge of God. I love how Augustine's, sorry to step on your turf, Felipe, but I'm going to give a long Augustine quote here. And I love how Augustine speaks of this in his homilies, right, on 1 John, where he speaks of the Christian life as one of holy desire. He says the entire life of a good Christian is holy desire. What you desire, however, you don't yet see. But by desiring, you are made large enough so that when there comes what you should see, you may be filled. God stretches our desire through delay, 
stretches our soul through desire and makes it large enough by stretching it. Let us desire then, brothers and sisters, because we have to be filled. See how Paul stretches his purse so that he may be able to receive what's going to come? As he says, not that I have already received or am already perfect. I do not think that I have laid hold of. What are you doing in this life then if you haven't yet laid hold? But there's one thing. I've forgotten what is behind. I've stretched out to what is ahead. In accord with the plan, I pursue the victory of my lofty calling. This is our life, to be exercised through desire. Now, how is this holy desire that Augustine speaks of, how is it manifest in the Christian life? And how can theological education, to use Augustine's image or metaphor, how can it stretch our purse to make us stronger desires for the love of God? Well, look with me at Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I want you to remember with me that Paul's recipients of these letters are in fact Christian learning communities, right? So look with me to here to see how Paul does theology, right? We might call this theological pedagogy as he's describing how he teaches these little learning communities to engage the subject matter of his letters, God's self-revelation in Christ. As we look at Ephesians, I want to emphasize two things, two aspects of Paul's theological pedagogy as to how they and how we engage God's self-revelation in Christ. First, no surprise, but notice how Paul's teaching involves knowledge and love. It's education and affection. It's information and it's holy desire for God. And second, notice how Paul, as he's doing his theology, is consistently narrating the triune God's purposes in Christ in a manner that's consistently incorporating the audience into that reality. So again, I'm not just interested only in the content here, the raw materials of theology, but in how Paul is doing theology and teaching his congregants how to do theology. I'm going to fly through this. Notice Paul beginning with the Jewish Barakah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us before the foundation. Right, the first 14 verses, what do they do? They start us out reading the letter to the, to the Ephesians in a manner that's appropriate to God's self-revelation, in, right, with blessing God in prayer, and in a way that's incorporating the Ephesians into, or the audience that reads it, into the story of God. He moves then to give prayers of thanksgiving and requests for spiritual insight. He prays that his churches will have a deeper understanding of God's saving acts in the person of Christ. He moves on then to describe himself as one who is basically an exemplar of the gospel. He's a prisoner of Christ. He patiently endures in faithfulness for the gospel. He holds himself up as the type of Christian leader they can respect, learn from, listen to, and emulate. He moves then to prayers of adoration, where he prays that his churches would understand the reality of Christ indwelling in them so they'll know the wide, how wide and long, how high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know the love that surpasses knowledge so that they can be filled up with the fullness of God. He engages in messianic catechesis, where he reminds them of their former way of life in ignorance and describes how now that they've learned the Messiah, they've heard him, they were taught in him, right, there has been a moral and ethical transformation that Christ has worked in their life. And he tells them then, let the word of Christ, well, this is Colossians, but he packs on yeah, hymns and songs in Ephesians 5, 16 through 18, right, be filled by the Spirit in a way that is then passing on and instructing each other through hymns, songs, and spiritual songs. The point I'm driving at is Paul communicates the subject matter of theological education in a way that is congruent with the worship of God. He teaches his learning communities through rational arguments, of course, we all know that, but maybe even more so through liturgy and prayers of thanksgiving and adoration, prayers requesting spiritual insight, hymns, songs, spiritual songs, poems, creeds, confessions, spiritual exemplars, and models. So when Paul prayed, he showed them, his churches, how to pray their own theology. When he gave them all the exhortations, meditate on spiritual truths, when he passed on or crafted his own poems and hymns, Paul was teaching his congregations how to read scripture for the love of God. So what would this entail for how we do theological education? for how we do scripture, teach scripture and theology. If the subject matter of our teaching is always the living God and the goal of human existence is always communion with the triune God, then all of our reading and our studying right, is for no other end than for the love of God. 
I know from biblical, I know from experience, sorry, how easy it is for theological learning to feel as if it's disengaged from God as the true goal of biblical interpretation. Knowledge of biblical facts, Greek and Hebrew uh, vocab and syntax, names and dates from church histories, right? There is so much potential information out there. And I agree, we want to know it, we need to know it. But Paul teaches us that the ultimate goal of our learning, studying, and reading is love of God. So please let me suggest three things. Three things that we could, can keep in mind. There's room for more reflection here. But three things that we keep in mind if we're committed to the love of God as the goal of our study. First, as all of us are students of the subject matter, the first thing I want us to focus on or think about is the practice or the importance of discipline and contemplation. Our primary knowledge of God comes to us, of course, through the Holy Scriptures. So cultivating discipline then to discover the meaning embedded in the specific diction, the grammar, the syntax of the text, when is right, really an outgrowth of our desire to know the love of God as revealed in the Scriptures. Paul's vision of theological education is one that I think calls us to a temp contemporary form of ascesis. It's a disciplined focusing of our intellectual energies on careful study. Theological study is hard work. You could all testify, right? In Augustine's On Christian Teaching, Augustine says, the first rule for becoming a good reader of Scripture is know these books. And he even says, if so possible, to read them so as to commit them to memory. So insofar as possible, Augustine tries to teach us to gain competence in the languages of Scripture knowledge of history, rhetoric, logic, so on and so forth. To handle God's word well, in other words, requires time, energy, effort, and discipline, which we believe to be worth it insofar as it's ordered towards the love of God. Our the but our theological learning can never simply be an instrument for something else, for good grades, for a degree, for showing off an impressive CV, for being recognized in the church or at the Society of Biblical Literature. Because when knowledge becomes instrumental, as Jack Baker and Jeffrey Bilbro note, it ceases to be a way of participating more intimately with the subject matter. So discipline, in terms of effort, needs to be combined with meditation, or what many in the Christian tradition have referred to as contemplation. Paul's exhortations, set your minds on, or consider these things, or his prayers that his churches would know the love of Christ, or the example that he offers of himself in Philippians 3, all of this calls for an approach to scripture and learning theology that we can best describe as loving knowledge of God. More than listing facts, more than excellent test scores, more than a type of knowledge that's simply instrumental or a means to some other end. Good theological education will make space for, will even teach us all how to practice a slow, meditative, prayerful, transform transformational reading of scripture. Second, prayer. Paul's opening prayer reports in almost all of his letters show us that the right way to approach the subject matter is through the lens of divine love and gratitude as they draw us deeper into an awareness of God's love in Christ. Paul says we have the gift of the Spirit and the enthroned Messiah in Romans 8 who help us pray and draw us more deeply into the experiential intimacy of love and communion with God as we read Scripture. Theologian Christopher Holmes says this, Prayer reorients our desires in such a way that we begin to desire God, our Father, who's supremely good. Prayer perfects our appetites. We begin to desire more and more what is good for us, which is God, end quote. I find it interesting that so many of Paul's exhortations to pray are often coupled with exhortations to rejoice, indicating that prayer is one of the ways we celebrate God's gift of making us shares in the divine life. Again, if Paul in Ephesians 1.18 says that prayer is for the purpose of so that we can have the eyes of our heart opened. The capacity to humbly receive and understand comes through no other means than through the Spirit working prayer in us. So again, Christopher Holmes, theology's food is scripture and prayer in the Spirit, it's drink. Thirdly, third practice as we seek to do theology and read scripture for the love of God. We need to be seekers of what I'm referring to as both meaning and truth. Learning how to do theology and how to interpret scriptures from Paul means that we're interested in, for lack of better terms, both of these realities. We're deeply interested in being able to, you can pretend you're in my Paul class, or maybe you actually are, use what we know about the Greek language, 
about the cities where Paul ministered, about what rhetorical or literary conventions Paul's using, what Old Testament text is he citing or alluding to. I mean, we're all exegetes of these ancient texts, deeply committed to their meaning because God's revealed himself in these scriptures. But in my view, Pauline theological education can never just only stay in the past, only repeating what Paul said. We cannot say something like this, well, in the first century, X, Y, and Z, and then imagine our work is done and over. As if once we've classified dikaiosune theu as a subject of genitive, put in contrast to ergonamu, alluding, of course, to Psalm 143 and providing a major critique of Roman imperial justice, I've done my work and I'm done. Yes, we absolutely will seek to use every possible means we have to understand what Paul meant by this incredibly important phrase. But theological education done in the manner that Paul describes will always seek to bring God's revelation in Christ to bear upon the situation of its hearers. Remember Paul again in Ephesians. This is no description of mere history from the first century. No creeds, confessions, traditions about Christ that are abstract that he just holds at arm's length. Everything that Paul articulates, he does so in order to bring the enduring, not just the meaning, but the enduring truthfulness of God's revelation to bear upon his churches. Stated another way, since the subject matter of the scriptures is the living and speaking God, the triune God, our reading, reading, studying, and teaching of the scriptures is inescapably self-involving, self-involving. The subject matter is a form of proclamation or address to humanity from God, about God. The subject matter is always calling you to make decisions that are pretty radical. They're calling you to believe certain things and not believe other things, live a certain way and not another way. In other words, Pauline theological education is about meaning and truth, history and existence, exegesis and application. I've already mentioned some of what this might look like in the previous section, but it looks like making Paul's questions our questions, even as we live 2,000 years later. All right, one more point. Practical wisdom for how to live with one another. Paul's vision of theological education is one where knowledge is used for the good of others. We know that there's a type of accurate, factual knowledge that's actually wholly non-Christian, a knowledge that's not rooted in love. Remember how Paul makes right, the relationship between love and knowledge in 1 Corinthians? And remember the priority that he gives to love. Right? At one place, he says, right, there are spiritual gifts that are going to pass away, but love will never pass away. Why? Because it's the way that we'll relate to God eternally and relate right, in communion with one another. So Paul's letters testify that he was consumed with developing these learning communities where people could pursue their quest to know God by sharing their lives with each other. Paul's vision of human flourishing, in other words, is interpersonal. We as individuals only live well, we only flourish in relation, in relation to God and in relation to one another. But Paul's theological teaching, of course, is incapable of providing rules and guidance for every imaginable scenario that his churches might face, let alone the first, cent I mean, the first century he can't do this, let alone the 21st century. But what Paul was capable of doing was working to cultivate the ancient intellectual virtue of phrenesis, practical wisdom. Phronesis is that intellectual virtue. It's capable of making concrete, practical decisions based on one's understanding of the supreme good. And it's what Paul describes in detail in Philippians when he calls the church to have the same phronesis that was in Christ Jesus, a practical wisdom that embraces humility um, and the pursuit of the good of one another ahead of one's own good. And it's the intellectual virtue Paul wants his churches to cultivate so that they can translate truth into practical wisdom. So much of Paul's letters are an attempt to cultivate these interpersonal virtues that are embodied in Christ. Because Paul, I think, believes the church, that the church is God's true apologetic. It's the place where the love of the triune God is made known. So if this is to be the case, let me very briefly reflect on a few aspects of Pauline phrenesis that might guide our theological education. Romans 15, Paul says, welcome one another as Christ Jesus has welcomed you. Paul testifies to God's purpose to create communities that embody God's love and hospitality. And if Paul could visit our churches, I think he would explain a lot of his work to us, uh, consisting in creating unified, loving friendship communities composed of diverse social identities. 
Jew and Gentile, different socioeconomic persons, different theological sensibilities and cultural scruples, um, uh, stated as simply as possible. Because the one who was in the form of God didn't consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, Philippians 2. Because Christ is the one who has hospitably welcomed all of us into his family, Romans 14 and 15. And because Christ is the Lord and the host of the Last Supper, of the Lord's Supper, not us. In other words, because Christ is the one that has extended hospitality to all of us to make one family, then the church is to be marked by the same posture of loving hospitality to one another. Now, I think making this Pauline theological claim, extend Christ's hospitality right, as Christ has, to one another as Christ has extended hospitality to us, is beautiful. I think the claim that the body of Christ is to be the manifestation right, of Christ's loving presence is compelling. I think it should be. We're inherently, we're inherently social, interpersonal creatures. We only thrive and flourish through good friendships, through right relationships with one another. Our eschatological destiny is sharing in the life-giving love of God communally with one another. There's a lot to say, little time. Let me just say that our theological education needs to be equipping us to learn about our similarities and our differences. It needs to be equipping us to explore our diverse theological convictions, our different cultures, languages, our histories, what it's like to be whatever your social identity may happen to be, and to do so with a posture of learning, respect, and love so that we can enter into the lives of others, so that we can be received as well, so that we can extend hospitality to one another and be, thereby become friends who display Christ's love and hospitality to the world. I'd obviously love to have more time to reflect on this, but I do commend to you the writings of a recent Henry Center lecturer, Willie Jennings who argued that theological educators need to work to design their institutions for, I quote, an intellectual affection that requires a discerning love which opens towards more intense listening and learning from one another. In other words, theological education needs to equip us to recover the importance of the ancient ideal of friendship amongst equals. And by equals, I don't mean anything like sameness. I mean friendship predicated on the fundamental shared identity that we have, having been welcomed into God's family in Christ. Again, I think Paul introduced something amazing and revolutionary into the world when he said, in Christ there can no longer be Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. In other words, for Paul, in his letters, social identities still exist. They're not eradicated but they don't provide the foundation or the basis for one's salvation or giftings. The equality then functions as the basis for affirming and empowering the equal worth and giftings of all persons in Christ and the rejection of the barriers that stand in the way of people using their gifts. Secondly, of course, every community, every serious friendship will face the challenge of what to do when one member offends, offends the other, another member. I think this is especially true if we're trying to be hospitable communities that right, embrace some level of difference and aren't just homogenous. And Paul's emphatic that his churches are to be the very place where God's peace and reconciliation and on, in unity is on display to the rest of the world. So Paul gives a lot of these sorts of claims and exhortations, right? Forgive one another, right? If anyone should have a complaint, just as the Lord forgave you, you need to forgive one another, Colossians 3. So the essential aspect, second essential aspect of Paul and practical wisdom to guide our theological education, I think, is forgiveness and reconciliation. But Paul doesn't just command his churches to do this, forgive, reconcile, be at peace when they offend one another. He gives us insight for how to do this. Maybe you know Paul's relationship with the church in Corinth. Paul has, right, written a letter that maybe has harmed or hurt, right, at least offended the Corinthians in one way or another. He said some rough things, kick out the immoral member, I can't praise you because of your divisions. I'd like to give you food. You're, you're still drinking milk. Right? And he's made visits that have been painful to the church in Corinth. He's caused pain, and they've caused him pain. So what does Paul do? First, Paul doesn't give up on his relationship with the church. He sends letters. He makes visits. He sends his own friends and emissaries to visit them. And he doesn't wait for them. Maybe Paul seems a little annoying in this regard. But Paul is the one that is consistently making the first move because he wants reconciliation. He knows Jesus is our peace. And he works tirelessly trying to create peaceful communities and communities that are at peace with him and other church leaders. But secondly, Paul tells the truth about the situation. 
He acknowledges the hurt and the pain that he's caused them. He acknowledges the emotional anger that he's aroused, even as he tries to give an explanation for why he's, act, he's acted in the way he has. He speaks the truth about the feelings of anxiety and pain that they've caused him. But he also constantly acknowledges the love and the joy he has for them. His truth-telling here just stems, stems from a desire for reconciliation. He says, we've spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you because he wants restoration of right relationship. Again, so much time we could spend on this, but I want to say Pauline theological education needs to be cultivating emotional intelligence, social intelligence amongst us. I mean, Paul is attentive to and even able to name the emotional pains that are taking place between him and his church. He's able to name and account for the joys and the anxieties that they're experiencing. So Pauline theological education acknowledges there are inevitable conflicts and challenges that are going to arise within the Christian community. But they are going to be friendships that will learn how to speak truth and hear truth for the purpose of forgiveness and reconciliation. In other words, it's a theological education committed to learning from theologians, social and cultural exegetes, counselors, psychologists, about how we can pursue peace, how we can learn to forgive and reconcile, how to deal with pain and hurt, how to establish boundaries even with those who don't operate in good faith. All right, my final one. If God so loved the world, so should we. If Jesus loved his enemies, guess what? So should we. And this is why Paul frequently says things just really simply like, do good to everyone. Learn how to love your neighbor. So the third aspect of Pauline practical wisdom is doing good to all people. I believe Paul is a faithful disciple of Jesus when he says things like, if an unbeliever wants to, you know, invites you over for a meal, you should go, eat, drink, and use it as an opportunity to please all people in all things. Why? So that they might be saved. I mean, this is what Paul says he does in 1 Corinthians 9 when he becomes all things to all people. What is Paul doing but foregoing his rights and privileges and preferences and instead voluntarily adapting his life to all types of people so that they might enter into Paul's life? Because who is Paul, right? If they come in contact with Paul, they come into contact with the life of Christ. What I'm saying here is this. Paul embodies the love of Christ in his neighborly interactions in hospitality with non-Christians, and he exhorts his churches to do the same. Paul is a faithful disciple of Jesus when he rejects all forms of violence and retaliation against one's enemies. Make sure, he says, that no one repays wrong for wrong. Always pursue the good of everyone for each other and everyone else, 1 Thessalonians 5. Seek to be at peace with everyone. If someone wants to harm you, give hospitality to them. Give them love and drink, Romans 12, uh, food and drink. Obviously, everywhere we turn today, we can see violence and conflict, hatred even. Maybe it's always been this way, that one of the deepest needs the world has is peacemaking. So Paul in theological education would explore the question, what does it look like to love the world, to do good to our enemies, instead of always thinking antagonistically toward the world and broader society, Right? Our theological education then can't avoid, as Mark Jordan notes, confronting the racial, the economic, ecological, ecological, and political anxieties all of us have. And I think there's a lot of room for reflection here, for learning how the church has failed. Maybe it's low-hanging fruit. But there's also room for learning how the church has succeeded in living out this mission. Think of the early church's practice of visiting prisoners, of ministering to the sick during the great plagues, basically of inventing hospitals, Today, we might think of world relief caring for refugees, safe families caring for families and children in times of distress, different pre Christian pregnancy centers caring for young mothers facing the challenge of unplanned pregnancy and parenthood, even our own mosaic house being a light in Waukegan. So if Paul's theological vision is one that would train us to love the world and seek to, sh er, not if, I think Paul's theological education is one that would uh, train us to love the world and seek to share the gifts of God with the world doesn't have to be just compassion and justice ministries, but can be basic forms of entering into the lives of non-Christian and seeking their well-being. Okay, so the vision of Pauline theological education I'm trying to set forth is something that's not just only an instrumental good, but it's something, it's not just something that's valuable because you get a degree and become a professional, or because it provides some type of knowledge that's useful for another project. Rather, the primary goal of theological education, the telos of what Paul is after, is an end in itself. Sharing in the life, love of God, 
life-giving love of God so that we are ever increasingly conformed into the image of Christ and radiating that love to one another and the world. So our specific learning, whether it be Greek or Hebrew, Greek, uh, Greek or Hebrew, effective pedagogical practices, Christian history, the mission of, the history of God's mission in the world, whatever it may be, they're not just useful skills and information. It's theological learning, right? Insofar as it's aimed at knowing the life-giving love of God actually is the goal of human existence. And it's a goal that we as ministers of the gospel have as our vocation to share with the world. I believe that the Apostle Paul was maybe the greatest pioneer of theological education. He was one who sought to establish multiple learning communities, gatherings of persons in Christ devoted to, as he simply says in Ephesians, to learn the Christ. So true learning for Paul, good theology, right reading of Scripture, is only done when love and learning, information and formation, catechesis and discipleship are working together. Okay, I'm done. I'm excited for the upcoming lectures. All of them are going to be engaging in one way or another from different disciplines, different content, different angles, what it might mean for us to pursue theological education with the first and greatest commandment as our ultimate telos and goal. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jip. Thanks for being here. Well, uh, it feels like a singularly dangerous thing to give a pastor a mic and tell them only five to ten minutes. But I'm going to try uh, and try to remark, make a few remarks on um, what Dr. Jip just shared. Uh, and I cannot, I guess I'll speak as a practitioner. I hope that's okay in this room. Is that all right? Can I do that as a practitioner? Um, I did my MDiv here many, many years ago, um, and I uh, walked into the Welcome Center hoping to find books, and realized that no longer does Ted's have a bookstore. Um, is that true? It's been a while. It's been a while, okay. All right, well, I was very sad about that. I was hoping to buy your book, but your book is back there. So there I already gave you a copy of the yeah, book. What oh, did you do right. with the first I, no, no, one? I did, I did, I did. I used it to hold my door open when, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding, I read it, I really love it. And, and I, I, I guess what I wanna say is I so deeply resonate with the goal of theological education being about the love of God. Because I think if I, and, and you did mention this earlier in your talk, um, this to me is the goal of formation and discipleship, sharing in the life-giving love of God. And I know that you draw heavily from the Pauline corpus. I get that. You just wrote a book on that. Um, obviously, we can look all throughout Scripture mm -hmm. um, to find, find this idea. Um, in fact, the way that I have started to think about discipleship as a pastor is what Jude would say, keeping ourselves in the love of God. Um, I think that my hope is that for my congregation, that's what we would do. We would help people stay in the magnificent, beautiful truth that they are loved by God, that we would hope, help people to do that. And of course, we know, um, as we have been invoking like Augustine, um, that, that, uh, this is, that there's a part that every Christian plays in that keeping of ourselves in the love of God. And we talked, we made mention of that. Augustine talks about ordering our loves properly. And I didn't realize that we would be on August, Augustinian turf today and that it belonged to a certain professor who sits, who's sitting over there, but I hope it's That's okay. That's you, Felipe. Really You're being talked attention. about, Felipe. I'm not really paying attention, but, but you know, like to tread on that. I'm, I'm used to this, by the way. I'm a pastor. I'm people I talk and people like... But, he, but when you say his name and, and he doesn't even know he's being talked about. Turning their phones to other people and saying, hey, look at this thing that just got texted to me. Anyway, I'm not throwing, trying to throw any shade. Uh, but it does feel nice to be 
on the other side, I guess, of the stage, of the podium. Um, but this is, I think this is, I think what I want to say is keeping ourselves in the love of God, and then, of course, also Jesus in the farewell discourse talking about remaining in love as I have thought about what is my vocation, it is to think about keeping our congregation in the love of God and also sharing in the life-giving love of the Father with all of creation. You know, I've been thinking about that. So very much appreciate that. And I also think uh, the second remark that I want to make is I think that it's particularly hospitable to talk about formation and discipleship in this way in our cultural moment. Um, and I just want to make a couple remarks about that. The first remark that I would make is I think that probably all of us are seeing around us in the world a decentering of cognition. I mean, we, as we have become postmodern, now desire is currency, yes? And so when we begin to start talking about the love of God, I think that's actually particularly hospitable to people who are postmodern themselves, who now start thinking about themselves as um, my primary goal or my project is to actualize my desires, um, to begin to start thinking about, to, to begin to start talking to them about what it means to actually love properly, I think we're on common ground. I mean, maybe we don't share all the same convictions, but we can at least have the kind of communication where we're talking face to face about things that are very similar, right? So that's one thing. The second thing that I want to say is um, I love that the love of God reminds us that um, the reality that we live in as Christians is social, yes? I mean, I think that like discipleship, as I have understood it or I have seen it practiced in churches, has been mostly about teaching people the right things. Yes, maybe some of you, when you grew up in churches, um, they were like, well, you should have a disciple. And the disciple, you know, was this person, and he brought this book, and, or she brought this book and opened this book to you, and then said, well, now you're going to learn about the Trinity. And you're like a child, and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to learn about the Trinity. And then they're like, well, it's not quite like water. No, no, that's actually a heresy. And then you're like, but I'm a kid. Well, doesn't that make sense? And you're like, no, no, no. So and like discipleship is about teaching you the right things. And then afterward, after you had learned the right things, then you were a disciple, right? It was sort of a catechism in cognition, you know? Um, and I have been a pastor for over 20 years, and I've seen that it doesn't work. When you teach people the right things um, for the sake of knowledge, um, I have seen little, almost no change in people. Um, I hope I'm not, I hope not, well, maybe you'll never invite me back again. But I'm just, I mean, I hope I'm not, Stepping to, I mean, the knowledge has to be hitched to the love of God, as is what you're saying. It's got to be, it's got to be embodied, right? Um, and so I, I love that uh, what you are in effect saying is you're saying that the knowledge is unto something. And oftentimes I feel like the message is knowledge gets you there, you know? Um, all right, that's the second thing that I want to say. The third thing that I want to say. Uh, is about practices. I so appreciate that you talked about practices at the end and gave us some concrete ways to actually do the love of God, not just actually to hold it as, as concept, hold it as concept. Um, because I, as a pastor, have thought, like, what can I actually give our congregation? Uh, how do we actually do the work of ordering our loves, as Augustine would tell us? Um, and uh, it, it, I believe, I'm like, I'm very influenced by Dallas Willard. I believe that doing the things that Jesus did embedded in the life of God actually does help to change us. Um, and so holding all of these things, ordering our loves toward uh, by practices, you know, um, by giving people concrete things to actually do, uh, feels really, really helpful. Um, here is where I have some questions. Uh, and I know that we will all, I would love to, we're supposed to, we're, we are going to have a conversation, so, I mean, I know there are microphones over here on both sides of the room, and please do come up and ask questions, but I would love to start if that's all right. Um, uh, I have two questions in particular. Um, as I have been sort of like, we have been like sort of reorienting our church toward the love of God, toward thinking about formation in terms of ordering our loves, um, acknowledging that we are creatures of desire, uh, and also teaching that, that um, 
that we can actually order our loves through practicing the way in the life of Jesus. And what I've noticed is um, you're not saying this at all. Um, you're not saying that, that any of these practices are theologically vacuous. I get that, you know. Um, but I, 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 I often find this tension of leaning hard into practices um, sometimes happens at the expense of having a theological spine. Mm. And so I don't know, really know how to hold both of these things together. Um, I'm trying to figure that out. So I'm trying to figure out, like, what does it look like to order people um, in the love of God so that, uh, so that, that the self-giving love of God is preeminent, you know? Uh, how do we do that in a way um, that is not theologically vacuous? So how do, we, how do we do both of those things? How do we hold those things together in the life of the church? I'm particularly asking that because like, I can provide all the practices that, that I want, but at the same time, I, I, I know uh, I, it's almost like it's like the, the theology is the other side of the coin. And it, it sometimes feels like to me, maybe in the world that we have like leaned way hard into practices, if you look at the literature that's out there, like for practitioners, it leads hard into like sort of a neo-monasticism. Um, and I'm left asking, what does it look like to educate people still? You know, that's the first question. Um, and I'd love for you to speak to that. But here's the second question. Um, I think that you use the word flourishing in this talk, and it's obviously in your book um, a lot. Uh, and I guess the thing that I'm curious about is, uh, is that word contaminated mm -hmm. by natural humanism? Yeah. So, and here's what I mean by that. So when I hear flourishing and I hear like, um, this is the ultimate good of humankind, um, I think people automatically use their naturally humanistic lens and say, okay, well that will mean self-fulfillment. You know, um, so I, th so, I think Charles Taylor states this really well. I mean, he's like, the Christian sense of flourishing bids us come and die. Mm -hmm. um, to be crucified ourselves, to yeah. give up our lives, to make our highest goal, as Taylor would say, reverence, or rather to make worship of the triune God the ultimate end, right? Which is what you're saying. Uh, this injunction, uh, the injunction that will be done, I think he says this really well, isn't equivalent to let humans flourish, even though we know that God wills human flourishing. Um, and I think that my question revolves around flourishing, self-giving. You use the word like self-giving love of the Father quite a bit in your book, I, th I think. And there is a giving. There is a sacrifice. There's a renunciation. Um, is the word flourishing contaminated? How do we hold flourishing with um, a clear, I think, biblical invitation to come and die? Yeah, so that's those a are the great, great questions. questions. Great questions. So the first one, I think, um, and I've seen this done at some, you know, in, in some churches or maybe certain places where it's been done poorly, but I've also seen places where it's done well and where basically, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to just be like, good job, Ted, you're doing this great at Vineyard. But like, at, you know, certain churches where, where there is sort of like an understanding that the practices that one engages in, spiritual practices, whatever they are, right, they're ultimately uh, uh, ordered towards something that has con content or information in it. And so any way I think that sort of like, you know, we can move, move beyond just you know, we say some stuff, we hear some stuff, we, you know, or whatever, and we get some information. Did you learn anything today? You know, and that's the goal. It's like to get away from that, but in terms of, right, are these communities ones that are maybe hearing, you know, sermons, um, saying the Apostles' Creed, and then able to, right, also explain, right, well, what are the specific practices that I'm engaged in, right, whether that's generosity, whether that's a certain form of communally, we hope certain things, yeah. whether that's, um, I don't, you know, prayer isn't something I do instead of read script. You know, there's like, the more we can see like the, all of the different practices that the scriptures give to us, right, actually have content. They're aimed towards something, right? There's a value that's like latent within that. So I hope, maybe I'm speaking too much like a, 
you know, abstractly. But I think insofar as we can consistently be right thinking about, are you in you know, relation with other Christians where that will provide a space or a context for the things that you're claiming on Sunday in the Apostles' Creed, or you're hearing proclaimed, or you're singing in the worship, right? Are you in a learning community where you ha have opportunity to actually practice these things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, I love that. I love yeah. I love the idea of like uh, I mean, the creeds. You know, like uh, when was the last time your church said the Apostles' Creed? I mean, like that's 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 helpful. And it's the creeds are very self-involving. I mean, sometimes I I'm not supposed to swear. Yeah, sometimes I I. I you know, a church a couple weeks ago, I mean, I was like, okay, I haven't, I haven't said this for a couple weeks. And just thinking about, like, I'm committed to some pretty audacious, bold things if I'm, say, if I'm saying that, yeah. right? Like, it's not just sort of the, you know, I believe in God the Father, right? As if this is, like, abstract. You are committed to a very particular way of life, right? That includes so many different things, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, second question, I would say, you know, I'm talking to some PhD students a little bit later. I think they've read a paper, skimmed it maybe, that's on... <laughs> Paul and the impossibility of human flourishing. Yeah. And what I mean by that, so I'm sympathetic for sure. It's like a cottage industry to talk, uh, you know, to, to give talks on human flourishing. So I'm, you know, I guess I contributed to that in one way or another. <laughs> um, but Paul's notion of flourishing is very paradoxical, yeah. right? Yeah. And some of what I was saying with the Philippians 3, if you remember, is, you know, it's, it's teleological, right? We are going, if, we, if, if the goal of human existence is sharing in the life-giving love of God, then, right, and that's something that we experience now as a foretaste of through the Spirit, right? Then, there, but it's also something that's future-oriented. Um, and so, as a result, right, we won't get our full flourishing until then. And um, this world has not yet been redeemed. This is still the present evil age, right, where, where Christ is sitting in power over the defeated, you know, dominions of darkness, so on and so forth. But, that, you know, the world is still irrational. The world still has evil. And so then for, you know, us to think, like, I should have a certain human flourishing that's maybe just me fulfilling my own quest for self-improvement or, what, you know, inventing my own, you know, meaning-making um, is not one that Paul gives. And it commits one to a way of life, right, where you see sacrifice, renunciation, love, humility. Um, uh, so there's, there's a lot of things. Paul was not a stoic. Paul did not believe the world was rational. He did not believe the goal of human life was, you know, that we would experience rational judgments so we could have good emotions. Because the world, right, still has darkness, pain, and suffering within it. And so at ri it's right at times to grieve or lament or be angry, you know. Um, and that's not the type of vision of human flourishing you typically get. Right. Um, and again, I just, just briefly, I guess I'd say, like, Paul's vision of human flourishing is very much not individual-oriented. As I said at one point in the lecture, it's, re it's, it's very much, you can only flourish in relation to Christ, and you can only flourish, right, in some form of belonging, community, and friendship with the body of Christ. Right. So, those are great. Yeah, thanks. And yeah. Thanks, Ted. Any other questions? Do you have any other questions? Yeah, there's a microphone right up there. A wonderful presentation. Um, I think I speak as a student for many years, um, you're one of your students for many years, that I can see a lot of what uh, you've talked about come out through your life and the way that you teach and encourage people uh, to learn. So in that vein, I would, I'll ask the practical question. As most of us here, almost all of us here are theological students in the process of our education, uh, going to where the Lord, we feel the Lord is calling us, what are some practical things you could share with us or you would have shared with yourself when you were standing and sitting in these chairs not too long ago about how we can develop these attitudes or practices that will allow us to remember uh, or continue to hold on to the truth of the end of our theological education, which is living in the love of God. So what are some things you could share with us? What would you tell yourself? Thanks, Jeff. appreciate that. You know, what's coming to mind is sort of the... Uh, the point on meaning and truth that I was talking about, you know, I, I think probably, you know, you go back to, I, you know, I mean, I've got some of former professors in here, right, Dr. Harris, so anyway, um, you know, it's like I would go back and say things like, um, don't give up, Josh, your love for, you know, um, rigorous attention 
to learning and to studying the text. As I was trying to say, you know, it really is a f discipline. It's so important. And I know it can be so hard, right? The ability to, you know, you learn a language, slow down. I read so too fast all the time, right? It's so different. So, so I would say, like, I would want to affirm that impulse that was within me and encourage you all. I'm not saying, you know, you need to be Greek or Hebrew scholars or whatever, whatever it may be. But, you know, cultivate that discipline practice of just, I mean, as Christians and evangelicals, we believe God has revealed God's self through the scriptures. So the discipline of loving the text and caring about it and, you know, me nerding out, making photocopies, I mean, I still make photocopies, but, you know, in the library of articles on Pistis Christu, I want to try to understand this little phrase that seems so important. So anything that's sort of like discipline, detailed attention, like, that is so good. I think that's great. But I would also say... Um, so the meaning and truth, right? The, 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 the truth element would be, I would have said this to myself, and I was, I was better at what I just said, obviously, than this part I'm going to say now, but would be like, open your eyes to the world. Like, see what you can learn about other people. See what you can, you know, learn about the world that you live in right now. Um, I didn't have back, I mean, it, it took a little bit longer for me to develop, I think, sort of like cultivating an ability to ask questions, you know, about sort of why does that community look that way or, or you know, what, what are some of the problems that are in society and does the church have any, right, in other words, there maybe it was too much of a churchy or religious element to me that wasn't, right, fully open to asking questions like I should be about the world so that, I mean, I think as Paul is saying to us, maybe I'm just, you know, um, I'm not thinking too much about Paul. This is all Paul, right? <laughs> like, you know, thinking about Paul in 1 Corinthians again. He adapts his way of life to others when he goes into their homes so he can learn about them, so that he can share Christ with them. Um, so I, he I hesitate to, you know, keep going on with that. But that would have been one of the, and, and maybe just one other thing. Um, I... Uh, um, I, I feel like I was so blessed by opportunities I had more when I was a PhD student to get out of my comfort zone and to get into different communities or, you know, prisons or whatever it was where I was able to actually learn from other people. Um, so just any opportunity you get to, like, learn about the world that God has created. We're all limited. We're finite. We need to understand our boundaries. We can't do everything. But I would love to, like, you know, see TED students. I think we are... I, I think, I'm not saying we're not doing well at this. I think we probably are doing well at this, but keep being people that are really lovingly devoted to the text mm -hmm. and also be cultivating this, you know, eye-openness to the world that we live in so that, you know, we can share the life of Christ with others through our relationships. Mm -hmm. It's great. Thanks. Love the question, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you very much. These are all former or former or current graduate assistants. It's like, I didn't put them up to this, but. Uh, my question is, is loosely based off of a historical experience that I had. So imagine you get in an elevator with, say, a, a pastor who says, well, we shouldn't send you know, uh, our enthusiastic congregants to seminary because uh, they, they love God and they're going to be great pastors, but then they go away to seminary and they just become academics. Um, you are on the ground floor, you're going to the 10th floor, go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like anxiety, um, which can be a good emotion for Paul at times, um, or an appropriate one. You know, for me, I, I, I'm thinking back to, you, you, theological education doesn't have to take one shape or form. I mean, I'm obviously pretty invested in this form of theological education at some level, right? But it doesn't have to take one shape or one form. That said, I mean, I would, I, I, and I'm not saying everybody needs to have, right, the type of theological education that is offered at TEDS or at another seminary. But what I will say is, right, I do think we need more of the teachers, pastors, leaders, laypersons in the church that have what I was talking about, a loving attention to the text. Not sort of loosely related, not, not just only a, a, um, a, a, a form of reading it that's like, what's the de devotional nugget, right? But one that is really able to make Paul's questions our own, right? To, and and where, one of the places I really learned that, and I felt like I was able to navigate graduate school decently after that. One, I mean, I learned that by, right, being formed and shaped by a lot of the kinds of things that take place in, right, 
at TEDS in a seminary classroom. But I was also exposed, even here, even if it took me a while to cultivate it, it was also a place where I was exposed to many things I wouldn't have picked for myself, yeah. right? Yeah. Different professors that have different theolo you know, theologies in the boundaries of the you know, EFCA statement. But right, different, <laughs> sorry, uh, but like different theologies at one level, different ways of understanding how to engage other people, people that had different ethnic cultural backgrounds, right, and them being able to take the content of their craft in a specialized way to, right, I mean, I don't know if I would have learned the practices that I needed, like, you know, empathy, um, uh, charity in terms of paying attention to other people's arguments or, or their claims. I, it was where I came into, you know, a, a place that forced me to make relationships with people that were different from me. It was the least homogenous period of my life. So I think that there are some things, uh, you know, it's like, I want theological education in the church, obviously, right? Um, but I think that there are certain skills, certain ways of uh, virtue, certain practices that seminaries, I think, are still distinctly suited to in terms of forming us to be loving learners. That was probably too long of an elevator speech. Slow, elevator. Slow yes. <laughs> Great question, Cooper, thanks. Hello, Dr. J. Hi, Lauren. <laughs> I was not your former graduate student, yeah, at least not right. technically. Eh. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything, but... Yeah, no, uh, yeah, don't. Okay. Um, so my question is uh, also practical. Um, wondering if you could give some advice. Given the fact that we live in a world that often commoditizes knowledge, whether through Twitter bites or even just whole platforms that are built, and I would say that Christian higher ed doesn't necessarily escape that temptation, I personally have felt the temptation to commoditize knowledge for our own selfish pursuits or even just a way to feel like I know more than the people around me. And that's been a struggle for me as I've integrated back into the world of the church and even just among people who love the Lord but don't know as much as I have had the privilege to learn. So what are some boundaries or some practices that would be helpful um, to put in place for all of us so that we don't fall into that trap. Um, for those of us who are going on for PhD studies or professoring or publishing or whatever it is, um, what, were some, what would be some things you would recommend? And I'm not asking for like you to solve the problem, but just some, some things that you can think of that have been helpful to you. Oh, that's a, that is such a good question, Lauren. Um, I speak, you know, practically, I mean, just in terms of like, you know, I was just, I was going for a walk yesterday with my dog Buxton, which I do every day, and was, you know, thinking about, um, you know, an upcoming podcast I'm going to do on the book, and was thinking, I don't really feel like doing this podcast, I don't really want to do it, and uh, I was thinking like, why did I agree to it in the first, you know, it, it posed, caused me to think about like, why do I do what I do, like write stuff? And it just was sort of like, I, I feel the ongoing need to sort of be like, my writing at one level really needs to be like for, if, if it is for myself, right? If it, is, if it is not all the stuff I was saying about like sharing in the life-giving love of God by trying to pay attention to the text in a way that maybe a couple of people will be helped by, mm -hmm. right? Um, then I think like at least like my, you, you know, like my, my motives are constantly going to need to be sort of like reframed or reordered or gone back there. You know, why am I on social media? Well, I, you know, I mean, I got off Twitter a while ago and I won't give all the 10 reasons why I got off, but there is, you know, at one level, you know, a kind of an anxiety that comes with sort of not being silly in, in a, like silly in terms of humble like it'd be silly if I was like I'm not gonna tell anyone I wrote a book I don't want anyone to know but also like examining my motives like why am I oh you know, am I on here to build a platform you know people you know ask me like why'd you get off Twitter right before you write a book you know it's like part of it was my own self-care I think and I don't know I mean social media I think makes this really challenging I don't know if I'm giving helpful boundaries but I am at hopefully at least indicating that for me it's, there is this ongoing sort of like ex self-examination of my own motives. Why am I doing what I'm doing, you know? Why am I here? And if it's not about sharing in the subject matter, 
communicating or living it out in a way that's helpful and loving for other people, then I think there needs to be sort of like a second thought in terms of why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you posting what you're posting? Could I speak to that? Yeah, you are probably way better at that. Yeah, well, to no, speak to that. I'm not, but um, I, I guess I, I guess I just want to say I, don't, I mean, Lauren, to your question in particular, and then Cooper, actually, what your like little um, the 10, 10 elevator, or 10th floor, or however long, elevator, like 25 floor. It was or, pretty long. Yeah. Or fifth. And anyway, I, I think I think that what I just want to say is um, I think that uh, Lauren, the, what you're pointing to so much uh, the commodification of knowledge. There's so much out there, uh, and uh, it is, there's so much noise. So I'm a pastor. I want people in my congregation with theological education. I wish that, I mean, to go back to the tension that I feel, we are asking people to um, embody the way of life, the, the, the embody the life of Jesus through practices, what he did, what the scriptures so richly teach us to do, yet I'm realizing more theological education is necessary, you know, um, because the practices can, can become like, well, oh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go read this particular scripture, and their hermeneutic is like shocking, you know, like, wait, wait, wait how did you get that? From, from that, you know, like I can't tell you how many times I'm in a conversation like, like that about, or, or our small groups, we have like, oh, aren't we so glad that we have 40, 50 small groups, and you see some of the things that are being taught in small groups, and you're like, ah, should I be concerned? Um, should I actually go to that small group and blow it up? And like, you know, you know what I mean? And so I just want to say, when I see this room of people as a pastor, we need you. We need you. And please go to church. Please, please go to church. Please find the church. Be a part of that church, you know. Um, and I do think there's a calibration period that has to happen for some of us, like, in school. Uh, and I think that calibration can only happen by being involved in the life of the church. It can't happen... Uh, I just think it, I think that calibration is social. You teach a class for your church, uh, which I would be so grateful for. If, like, Lauren, you were at my church and said, hey, Ted, could I teach, like, about this particular thing? I'd be, please, please, <laughs> please do it, please do it, because we need more of it. And, um, I, you know, Dr. Jip, like, mentioned that there is this, like, like widening gulf between theological, what people can actually afford can people afford theological education? I don't know what the solution of that is, but I just know that you are already here. Would you please serve the church? Uh, we want you. And if, if I'm a pastor and somebody comes to me and says, I want to do some theological education, I would say, please do it. If you can afford it, please do it. If you can do it in a way that's equitable, please do it. Or somebody comes to me and says, I want a scholarship, some of our people of color, so that they could do theological education. I'm like, oh, please. Please, please do it. Because the preponderance of noise actually brings confusion. Um, so there's a commodification of knowledge. If I have a lot of knowledge, then that means that you see me as an expert, and that means maybe you'll elevate me, or like my followers, blah, 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 blah will go to 200,000, and I'll have the blue check. Blah, blah, blah. Did I pay for it, or did I actually get it? You know what I mean? <laughs> like so, but those people actually are harmful, not helpful to me and to our congregation. To have voices... Uh, that are faithful to the gospel is what we need in church. And to have a preponderance of voices, not just one talking head. In our cultural moment, to have a person, a celebrity pastor, who is the sole font of all knowledge is bad news. It is bad news. To have multiple people who are faithful to the gospel, who care about the church, and who want to teach uh, the people in the church. I mean, we have classes on Job and Joshua, and I mean, like, and they're full. People are like, I want to go to this class. I'm like, really? Why? Like, I, you want to go to a judges class? That's like a really sad book. I want to learn about judges. I mean, I just, I just want to learn, you know? Like, so the class is full when we, when we do them. I'm grateful for anything that can happen, you know, like in the life. Of the church. I want Josh to teach at our church. We want, 
I think that for too long, I don't know where the unhealthy sort of kind of division between the academy and the church actually happened, but it must end. It must end for the sake of the world, you know. So that's what I would say. Thanks, Ted. Our, you know, the, our goal is here to bridge the gap between the academy and the church. So I'm grateful for you and grateful for those words. Thank you. Well, would you join me in thanking Josh Ted?